We have all heard the saying that great minds think alike. But in diversity, great minds should definitely think, but not alike. That would be groupthink. And in this video, I'm going to give you five reasons why groupthink works against diversity in the workplace. Now, if this is your first time to the channel, I want to welcome you. I'm Dr. David Clover, and it is my mission to share moments that inspire both leadership and self-development. So if that's you, go ahead and sit on down. Let's talk a minute. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the bell so that you're notified every time a new video comes out. They come out weekly. So when we're talking about the concept or the saying that all great minds think alike, we have to really challenge that. We have to look at that because although it sounds good, it sounds very um, reputable, but the actual truth is when you pull back the layers of that, it actually is a breeding ground. It anchors itself in, in a, a, a thought that breeds what we call groupthink. And so in order to frame this conversation that we're going to have, let's define groupthink, which is the practice of making decisions as a group that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. I'll say that again just for clarity. It is the practice of making decisions as a group that discourages creativity or individual responsibility. So let, let's detail five different ways that this is done. Number one, it decreases accountability. When you are in a, um, in a group setting making decisions, whether you're at the round table or square table in a public venue with people coming up or submitting, however it's done, what happens when you have group thing is that it shifts the ownership and the accountability. I always style whenever I go and do um, any type of group sessions and decision making, whether I'm the team or facilitator or both many times, um, I style it as a soup. I, as the facilitator, I may bring just the broth. I bring just actually the very base of this soup, but everybody has their ingredient that they need to add into the soup to make it a full flavored soup. Well, if you only allow, and usually it is the either the manager, um, the title or person, the person that has the title, or the person that you feel has the most dominant influence in the room, whether it's because they've been there the longest or they've seen or uh, a lot of changes, so they're, they're, they may feel entitled. Whatever. When you allow one or two persons to actually make all the decisions and you just go along with it, it shifts that ownership of the, the soup or the, de the decision, the, whatever you're trying to put together, whatever plan that you're, you're trying to tackle, it shifts that ownership. So then what is presented to the stakeholder or to the general populace or to the employer organization is really not the ownership of everybody. It's really of just the one or two persons that created this idea that became the essence of groupthink, that everybody just went along. Not only that, it skewed the responsibility. So now, you, 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 although you, you were there, you don't take responsibility for the decision, for the end result, for what actually really happened. It was like, well, I just went along with what they said. Well, I just didn't want to um, rock the boat. But that is actually a, a very dangerous thing when you don't add your thought, when you don't add who you are, or when it is not allowed. Um, because com some cultures, are, they don't allow it. And we'll talk on that um, actually coming up, which is number two. It creates, groupthink creates a us versus them culture. And usually it's done by intimidation. So if everybody is going with this one thought and so you, a new thought doesn't have room to arise. It, 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 it fears retaliation for going against the grain, for being the rebel, for being the voice of reason, for being the whistleblower. All these groupthink uh, type of, of determinants that kill and assassinate creativity is breeded from out of that culture that us versus them that they don't think like we like the rest of us or all of the leaders have this same type of dodge or take same type of perspective now 
understand that I am saying that within each industry, there is a trend, there is a, a burgeoning um, a thought pattern or sustained thought pattern. But I'm saying nothing new, nothing innovative comes when everybody thinks alike. So it, you, it, to create this, this us versus them only makes it a very um, tedious uh, journey uh, coming to work, organization, and culture when you don't allow them to have that thought, when you don't let it have a safe space for them to express something that that's not popular, where you, you shoot it down even before it's said, or you let it be said and ignore, which is all still very traceable and can actually be noted. You know that they're not really listening to me, even if they allow me to say this freedom of expression is only expressionable. It is not the actual day-to-day -day working theory where it's actually considered or weighed in the balance or say, hey, how will that look if we flesh that out? So again, number two is that it, it creates a us versus them through intimidation. Okay, number three, it creates an anti-diverse culture. This is where you, you, everybody is doing the same thing, dresses the same way, they go the same way, that's just how they are. Well, that creates something that's unusable. That creates something that doesn't have ebbs and flows, that does not allow for um, creativity to be livable, to be breathable. There, um, there are many organizations, as you study them, that have adopted the thought of even, you know, they take out time, they carve out time in your, if it's a 40 hour week, five hours is due to do your own thing, to do your own creative, to, to try other things. And many um, million and multi-million dollar uh, thoughts, patterns, and, and devices have come out of, try something that is totally um, um, non-conventional for what we do. It's not group thing. It's not about how we all normally do it, our normalcy for day to day. Because you can't take you can't take um, good giant steps and reap the rewards of them if there is no risk. And that is even why in project management and leadership we have a thing called risk assessment because. There needs to be some type of risk to try something new in order to stay competitive, to stay in the market with those who are around you, your competitors, to stay even relevant to our ever-changing society and culture. So when you, when you have a group think society, uh, organization, teamship even, it takes away your diversity. It, 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 it snuffs out its capability for illumination of thought. Even if that thought has to be worked around or has to be curtailed or tweaked and has to be, you know, worked, massaged into the minds and to acceptability, it could be your next breakthrough feature. It could be your next breakthrough million dollar marketing tool and technique and your uniqueness, which is vital to your, your long lasting sustention in the marketplace. Groupthink does not work. Number four. Number four is that groupthink does not allow you to have a wider scope. It, uh, it only allows you to focus on a narrow thought pattern without ideology being able to be birthed. It, it, it only allows shallow fishing. Um, it only focuses on what basically is already known, what has already been trailblazed and does not allow, again, if we go back to that soup, it does not allow other seasonings, herbs, and, 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 and ingredients to have a play um, so that we can have a different soup that appeals to a different mouthfeel, a different palatable um, group of people. So when you when you think about group thinking, you think about the stifling of of information. So even if you bring someone brings information or an idea or a concept or a perspective that's not like what is norm, it gives you opportunity to visit and to explore, to extrapolate, to go down and dig out the different things of what nutrients are, what are the goods that come from here? What are the goods? What are the pros and the cons? What are the, the different things that we could maybe use? 
Maybe we can't use its whole concept, but parts of it can be implemented into what is already working, can be already borrowed into something that's pre-existing, or maybe we can start something new and take only fragments of what is existing for branding sake or for whatever else and put it over into this new creative idea. Exploration is the lifeline of every organization. Exploration is the lifeline for every organization, team, and culture. You have to be able to explore um, in order to be remain competitive. So number five is simply at the very core, it discourages engagement. And it really, number five should be number one, but it discourages engagement. The very fact that what I said is accounted for or made people think or made people acknowledge me helps me to feel engaged at work, help me to feel, helps me to feel engaged in this team, in this organization, that what I say has value, what I say has, has volition and, and can, can put, put legs to. Maybe it needs to be sharpened, but you can see even my deficiency by what I, what I I speak so maybe I need to be brought up in some areas or but you need to know that both as the worker and the leader where I am in this team where I am in the thought process because all of us come from big different backgrounds all of us come from diverse areas and we all want to feel wanted It's one of the the uh, Maslow's laws of order is that we, we want to feel counted we want to feel a part we want to be in the in group and there's another whole video I'm gonna do about in group and out group which is a part of that us versus them type thing but engagement puts you in the in group and we want everybody it is the leader's job to make sure everybody feels a part of the team that you are equally important now there may be some functions that are vital or maybe at way heavier but even the two percent that you're doing makes a deficiency to the hundred percent product that we need and you have to make sure you invest that type of time that type of energy to every concept to every um, voice to every idea even if you deem it not usable at this time the very fact that you are engaging is usable maybe not the words that you utter are most usable but the, your 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 willingness to utter those words is workable. It's something that is salvageable to be able to keep on moving in the right direction. So you want to be able to increase engagement, which is one of the deficits in all workplaces all across the globe. And Perga data shows that that this is that engagement. Of course, as we as you study the basis, you know that engagement um, is indicative of high turnover, to tardyism, absenteeism, to um, completion of work, to the actual efficaciousness of work. You want to be able to make sure your engagement stays high. Well, you do that by honoring a non-conformed group, that it is okay to be different. It is okay to think differently. In fact, we encourage it. If everybody is thinking the same way, somebody is not thinking. Bottom line, there is no excuse for great minds to all have the same concept because even in the same house, growing in the same, um, growing up in the same neighborhood, in the same community, different thoughts burgeon. You have, you, you actually look at sometimes brothers and sisters and you put them next to each other, same mother, same father, raised in the same home, completely different. So there is no excuse why your whole team thinks exactly the same. It actually is a red flag that your culture is not good. Right.